matter who we started, the good old story of who we got started. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take you through it really quick. So Google got started when I remember a certain brand said, um, we don't make our drug, our, our boots for drug dealers. And I wasn't a drug dealer. I was a, I was a waiter at Red Lobster. And, and, I, and I started to say, well, what is any brand or company going to really respect where they make their money from? And not necessarily about being an African American, but it was about being a culture that loved Timberlands. You know, we love Timberlands, Adidas, Levi's, and all those brands. So came up with the name Four of Us Bias. And, uh, what I did was for about three years, I took 10 t shirts, same 10 t shirts, and I would put it on a wrapper and I would take it back. I would put it on another wrapper and I would take it back. I would put it on another wrapper. The only wrapper that didn't give it back was ODB. <laughs> we want it back from right. ODB, right? Um, God bless the dead, incredible right. dude. Um, but after about three years, every video had this food shit on it. People thought I was this huge brand when I was just a waiter in Red Lobster with nine stinking shirts left, you know? So, I mean, that's the, that's the, that's the quick story. And then, you know, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. I closed food down, I think, three or four times before um, I ever made it, you know? I was just ran out of money, and, but I just kept following my dream. I loved what I was doing. Awesome. How did you get your boys involved? I mean, you guys grew up together. Yeah, so, so how did I get my boys involved with it? You know, like probably after about the third time of closing it down, um, like anything, you know, everybody wanted to be part of a movement. Right. And, you know, if you ever see all the older food product, it has an old five on it because it was always me and four of my dudes. But one of them cats would never stick around. And then it ended up just being me and three of my guys. Now, there's about five guys out there who didn't stick around and were like, yo, I should have just waited and hold right. out. But, you know, we were living in the house together. Um, we were taking this food with stuff, we were slinging on the road in the streets, going to concerts, having a good time, wearing it. We just felt like we were part of a movement, so we weren't really working as far as we were concerned. You know, we were just having just a good time. Your dream. Yeah. Um, how did you guys get the hip-hop endorsement? You said that you was giving it to rappers. How did right. it get to that point? And then also, how did it get to the point where it got large? Well, you know, we got the, the mark from hip-hop because we were raised in Hollis, Queens, and and, um, you know, Russell Simmons used to obviously drive by there every day and he was putting on salt and pepper and he was putting on LL, Beastie Boys, or whatever. And we started going on tour with LL and we were like roadies on the tour. You didn't have to tell me that I had been going on a tour to see these guys that I, I, I admired and just and just have a great time. So, and I could put something on them. Right. So we were just on there just hanging out doing that and we started to know everybody. And at that time, you know, we're at a time now where you have all these guys becoming millionaires and whatever because rap is this. At that time, nobody respected the rappers outside of the fans. So companies would come down there and give them some product and go, I don't care what your name is, just wear it. And, and these artists, they didn't feel like that. They had their own hood money at the time. I mean, maybe some of them was almost millionaires, but they didn't want to get talked to like that. Right. I'm coming by as a fan. I'm like, yo, man. Can you please rock this? And they, and they supported me. L said to me, I'm going to invest in you. I'm going to wear this. And, and that's how it goes. And everything in this world, every brand starts off as a spark, as a movement. And, then, you know, and that's what we took advantage of and living the dream with it. Now, okay, now FUBU is established. You guys are doing your thing. I even bought FUBU. Right. And at the, I remember at the time I bought a jersey, it was like 50 bucks. Mm -hmm. Black right. and silver FUBU. All right. Right? Um, when did you decide that I gotta get off this train as far as the day-to-day -day hustle of FUBU and you sold it? But so, you know, that's a bit of a misconception. You okay. never sold FUBU. Oh, okay. It's still on it. And you gotta understand why that's a misconception. Okay. Because, you know, nobody could ever say that, that FUBU is whack. Nobody ever could say that these cats ain't designed. Nobody could ever say that. All they can say is, ah, they sold it, don't buy it. But we didn't mind them doing that because you know people are gonna start rumors and do whatever the case is. So I'm a you know I'm a person who's been very blessed in my life to to have fashion around me, whether it's this brand or any of my brands that I have. We never get up the day they grind. What it is is that brands have a life cycle, you know, and it's amazing. I'll see a cat in my Coogee brand or my Crown Holder brand or my Drunken Monkey brand, and they'll be looking at me going. 
Yeah, you that Fubu cat, man. That stuff is whack. I, don't know, I can't believe you ever designed that. Nigga. You don't know about this. Like, I have no doubt. Maybe wearing my brand. <laughs> so, if you understand the business behind everything, you'll say, listen, you know what? The lifeline of a, of a brand is supposed to be three to five years. I've been rocking out for eight to nine years. Let me move this over to Europe. Let it get cold here for a little while. Let everybody, you know, get hot on and over here. Let me put something new in this, still in this place. So it's all strategy on how you put it together and make people, basically it's wagging the dog. You know, you make right. people think that they, they're smarter than you and it's okay, you know what I mean? You have your right to not want it anymore. If you have five, 10 years of food in your closet, y'all want something new, right. you know? And I don't want to make it anymore for you either because I want a new customer. Right. So it, it's all good, you know? Awesome. Um, so, what are the what are some of the things uh, businesses you've uh, ventured with since you've done Fubu and you've been successful in that genre? Well, um, you know, with Fubu, as I said, many of the lines, Willie Esco, I have probably about fifteen other lines, and I'm not saying that we all have fifteen lines right. because out of the fifteen lines, three of them have bailed, four or five of them are just dormant one or two would pop really well. But you know, it's a it's a constant, you know, it's a constant rebranding, redevelopment. So that's that space I'm in. But um, after uh, going on to Shark Tank, um, obviously I've had a lot of real estate stuff. I started a branding company where I kind of advise people, whether it's a small individual or it's a big corporation on how to, how to position their brand, and how to create it and, and, and make it relevant to a certain segment or a market. Um, and then on the show, you know, I acquire probably about eight companies a year, um, and we go through it. And I probably, you know, will have a challenge with four or six of them because this, this is how it is. I mean, right. you know, there's this business. So um, I'm into the tech space now. Um, I'm into apparel. I'm into uh, what other companies? Um, hard goods. You know, some some stuff that's in, in stores that I can't name all of them. Right. Uh, so, I mean, listen, I'm, it's yeah. a hustle on whatever level you're at, it is a hustle.